Welcome, everybody. Welcome to 2020. Can you believe it? We're in a brand new decade. Now, how many of you, uh, how many of you, sometime in your past, you thought we would never make it to 2020? Anybody with me? There was a time when I thought we, our universe will never see 2020. I remember we put our kids into a kindergarten, and for whatever reason, they, uh, they go ahead and label them by the graduation date, which I think is an awful idea. Fro it just freaked me out when I was, you know, putting my kid in kindergarten. But I saw the date 2019, I thought, we will never see that happen. I mean, not because I didn't think they'd graduate, but because I didn't think we would be here. Anybody with me? We're at 2020, y'all. Now, years ago, there was all sorts of ideas and prophecies about what would happen by the year 2020, what things would be accomplished at that point. And some of them are right and some of them are wrong. One of them was that we would have a life expectancy on average of 100 years of age, that we would live to be 100 on average by the year 2020. How many of you know that's wrong? Okay. Uh, another thing they had, though, or they predicted would happen was that every single person would be tracked every moment of the day. And I think they're pretty close to that. I mean, when you think about it, you got doorbells that can see everything going on. Your television is watching you while you're watching it. Your phone is listening to you while you're talking into it. And even at times when you're not, it's just laying there. It's pretty creepy. So that, that came about. And then another one was that we would have self-driving cars by 2020. And uh, that, that has not come to fruition. In other words, it hasn't gone to market yet. They tested it, killed a few people, said, we're not ready yet. But... Um, but I look around and I look at people driving, and as a pastor, I can't say the word stupid or moron, so I'm not going to use those words, uh, but I'll let you sort of think about what you would say. But there's a lot of people driving that shouldn't be driving. And so when you add to that a population of cars that have no one in them, that just doesn't seem right. Anybody with me? So there's a lot of things going on here in 2020. We're going to be talking about uh, 2020, we're going to be talking about the decades, but, but I just want to welcome you. I want to welcome all of our campuses uh, to this. This is our first weekend of the new year, and we're very excited about it. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Patrick Conrad. I'm the lead pastor at Life Fellowship Church and honored to be a part of a church that's one church in multiple locations. All throughout DeSoto County, we have other locations that are meeting and gathering and uh, it's exciting because it allows us to pull kingdom resources and use them in a way that really blesses God and I think brings glory to Him. But it also uses our resources in a very wise way. Uh, we have a central message. We all share the same message on the weekend, but every campus has their own staff, their own team, their own ministries, and it's amazing. So I want to welcome all of our campuses at Olive Branch, South Haven, at Hernando and our West Campus, as well as the ladies at God Behind Bars in Henning, Tennessee, and the men at God Behind Par at Bars in Parchment, Mississippi. Can we welcome everybody to the weekend? Thank you, and those who are joining us online as well, excited to be here. You know, every time at the beginning of the year, it seems like we do a message about getting in shape, uh, whether that is physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally or maritally in a number of different ways we talk about getting in shape and and many of us often move closer to those goals that we set out to do others of us uh, we make a limited effort and then we fall back into those patterns that leave us living our second best life rather than our our best life and we get frustrated and uh, it can become disappointing and I, I I just was sort of thinking about this year because it's so unique uh, that we're not only turning the calendar over to a new year but we're turning the calendar over to a new decade. And I thought about it, you know, one of the reasons why we don't hit all our goals many times is because there's not that sense of urgency that really grabs us and says, you, this is not an option. You must do this. And I thought, what if we added some gravity to the fact that we're starting something new? And I thought, man, you know, if you take your life and you reduce it down to decades rather than years, that adds a little gravity. Now, they say that on average, sociologists and people who study such stuff say that, you know, we will live about 75 years. And, and I know there's some people that are living longer than that. This is your birthday. You're 75. You're 80. You're not going to die. Okay? This is just a stat. Okay? I'm just telling you, I didn't make this up. All right? But they say we're going to live about that long. Many people live longer. And so I thought, what if we reduce that and thought about it in terms of decades? So instead of 75 years, that can seem so ubiquitous to some people, depending on where you are, 
7.5 seems to add a little urgency, doesn't it, to your life? It, it seems to add a little gravity and focus and purpose. And I think about the decades, and we just saw a bumper video about the number of decades. And many times, uh, you and I will just go through decades like we're in a little, uh, a little ride at Disney World. And we're just sort of viewing the decade. And the images and the events of the decade are flashing up on the walls, just like that bump video we saw it. And I don't want to pass through another decade just having memories. I want to enter into this next decade with such intent and purpose that I leave a memory and I make a memory. And I really have an impact on a generation and a group of people based on what my life stands for. I want my life to transcend the 7.5 that I'm scheduled to live in. And amen? I want it to stand for something. And so as we start out this series of 7.5, we're going to look at a number of different things over the next four weeks. But I think if we're really going to understand the weight of what it is and why it is we placed on this earth and how we can make the most out of it, rather than just go through another cycle of New Year's resolutions only to be disappointed and disillusioned by a reality that we seem to not be able to push the needle on, what if we made a difference by leaving a legacy? I want to start this weekend with this series by sort of setting up where we're going. And I want to talk to you about how to leave a legacy. You have a handout that you got when you came in. And the text there we're going to go to is found in Joshua chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there, you can. If not, it'll be on the screen in just a moment. But I want to start by talking about Joshua 3 because it sets up where we're going. And, and it's really a, an incredible picture of how you and I can leave a legacy in our life and with our life for the next generation and in the next decade. Joshua chapter 3, the nation of Israel has been traveling on a long, arduous, taxing 40 years out of the Egyptian oppression through the wilderness. And now they are on the precipice of the promised land. Uh, Moses has passed the baton to Joshua and they are there uh, almost. All they got to do is cross the Jordan River and they'll be in the promised land. And so God tells Joshua, hey, I'm going to do a great thing. I'm going to do a mighty miracle here. I want you to tell the people to get ready. I'm going to establish my glory and I'm going to make sure they understand that the same God that brought you here will sustain you in the land. Somebody needs to hear that. The same God that brought you here will sustain you. And he said, Joshua, Joshua, I'm going to let everybody know that the same God that was with Moses will be with you. And so he said, tell the priest, tell them to take the ark right to the edge of the water. And when their feet step into the water, I will stack the waters up. Now, you need to know that if you read chapter 3, the waters were at flood stage as they were in harvest time. And so he says, the Bible scholars tell us about 20 miles up, the waters began to stack. And the, 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 the entire uh, Israeli people just marched across. And there was, you just imagine the city of Memphis and the surrounding suburbs all moving across the Mississippi, okay? I'm just just to give you a visual there, okay? There's more people than that, but just think about that for a moment. So they all walk across. And this is where we pick up in chapter 4 and verses 1 through 7. Again, it'll be on the screen for you if you don't have it, starting in verse 1. And when all the nations had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Take twelve men from the people, each from, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, Take twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you, and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. And Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed a man from each tribe, and he said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come. What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan. And the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. Amen? Now, 
These memorial stones raised in the Old Testament were a common way of retelling the stories and the greatness of God. Every time these memorial stones were set up and people asked what do these stones represent, it gave a generation an opportunity to bring another generation in to participate in the great things that God had done. It was more than just a story. You were able to participate in the glory of God that was revealed. I remember I took my son to the 9-11 memorial. Now, my son was born just months before 9-11 occurred. And so he knows nothing about 9-11. Uh, he doesn't know what happened. Uh, he, doesn't, I mean, he, 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 he was not there, let me say that. When we went to the memorial, he was engrossed in it. He saw the video. We walked through those halls. We saw all the things going on. We saw actual pieces of the building still there. He heard the stories. It was amazing. And he was so enthralled. Why? Because he was almost participating. There was a memorial there that he was connecting with. And that's what these stones really were all about. And it was a common practice in the Old Testament. And one that I think that we at the beginning of this decade could reinstitute. Amen? Amen. But there's two things that the memorial stones represent, and they're not in your notes, but I want to share them with you. The first is this. Memorial stones represent the glory of God above all other things. In other words, uh, those stones were set up so that the people, when they looked upon them or when they were asked about them, could tell about the glory of God and how he had brought them all the way through the wilderness to this blessed place. He had been good to them, and he had done great things. He was a powerful and great God. And they talked about all the different miracles that he did to bring them to this place. And then they gave thanks to God for what he did. Now listen to me. I want to stop this service right now, and I want to give us an opportunity to do the same. We put together a recap video of 2019, and it doesn't share everything, but it is a way of, of sharing the stories of, of life change, of marriages healed, of finances restored, of jobs created, things that God did through his kingdom called the Body of Life Fellowship Church, the Body of Christ. And I want you to watch this video, and then we're going to give him some glory. Check it out. Amen. At all of our campuses, can we just praise God for all that he did in 2019? He's been so faithful. He's been so good. And I want to tell you that all of those things that you just saw and many events that couldn't be recorded are just memorial stones that are set up to share the story of God's goodness. Amen. The second thing that a memorial stone stood for, B, is the faithfulness of God to each of them. Notice that he told one person from each of the tribes, I want you to go back and grab a stone. In other words, each of us have stories to share about how God has been faithful to us. Amen? And some of us maybe are here and you had a difficult year. Last year you looked back at 2019 and everything wasn't up and to the right. 
There was sickness that plagued you. There was maybe a death in the family. Maybe there was some loss of finances or some other things in your life. But can I tell you something? The stones and what they represent do not change. The memorial is to the faithfulness of God in spite of the temporal nature and the craziness of this world. In fact, I want you to know that he, tell, he told them twice to go to the midst of of the Jordan to go to the middle of the river. You know that's the lowest point, right? That's the lowest point. That's what you would call rock bottom. Now, I don't know if that's where they got this phrase to get a rock in the bottom of the Jordan, but that's what some of you, your life was like that last year. Maybe it was rock bottom. Maybe some of you guys who are at the prison right now, maybe last year wasn't that great for you. Maybe a generation hasn't been great to you, but I want to tell you something. You take that rock and you take it to the other side and you lay it down as an act of worship and say, God, you're faithful. In fact, God, there's greater glory that you get when I display your faithfulness in my life when things aren't good than when things are good. And I'm going to be faithful to praise you no matter what. Amen? That's what those memorial stones represent. And that's what it means to leave a legacy. And I want to talk to you over the next uh, several weeks about leaving a legacy as a church, leaving a legacy as individuals. I want to make a mark. 7.5. we got to get this done. Amen? And so let's talk about this in your handout. There are three big ideas that I want to hit you with concerning leaving a mark. But they start with this question, a question I want you to ask yourself, a question that is pointy and maybe hurts a little bit in the most vulnerable parts of your soul. But I think we need to ask it. And here it is. If you continue, it's at the top of your handout, if you continue to live your life the way you're living it right now, what kind of legacy will you leave behind? <laughs> you know, we're all leaving something behind, right? Whether it's good or bad, you're leaving a legacy. Some people, I, I, don't, I, I don't have the capacity to leave a legacy. You're speaking over my head. No, you're leaving a legacy. It's just a matter of what kind of legacy you're leaving. Are you going to leave something that's going to make a spiritual mark on a generation, on your children? Is it something that is eternal that will last or is it simply a lump of money and a list of assets that will be read to your children and grandchildren by an attorney? What kind of legacy are you going to leave? I want to talk to you about how, through these three big ideas, we can leave a legacy that lasts, okay? Three big ideas, and they'll come together at the end. Uh, not rocket science, but I believe it's very uh, important, and I pray that the Holy Spirit really stirs your spirit uh, to understand and live these things. The first is this. Ready? Fill in your blanks there. If you're new with us, we have notes every week. Fill in the blanks, and, uh, and actually you can do it online on the app as well. And I pray that you'll use this throughout the week as a devotional guide to sort of stay in tune with what God is saying, not only in this message, but through the message and you listening to God speak to you personally. Number one, focus on character over accomplishment. Focus this next year, the next 10 years, the next decade that you have, focus on character over accomplishment. Now, let me, let me just, uh, just give you this as an example, okay? I'm going to say some names, and you think about what comes to mind. Neil Armstrong, first man on the moon, right? Michael Phelps, multiple Olympic gold winner, gold swimmer, whatever he was, right? <laughs> Uh, Steve Jobs, right? Apple co-founder. Adolf Hitler, okay, he killed about six million Jews, responsible for that, leader of the Nazi party, right? Yeah, you know, I, I, every time I share a name, guess what? You and I generally go to what they did in history rather than who they were. We, we look at their accomplishments, whether good or bad, rather than looking at their character, in part because we're not in proximity to them. You know, we don't know them. Well. Maybe if, uh, if, if, if uh, Michael Phelps was my little brother, maybe I would know him a little. I'd know his character a little bit, but I'm not in proximity with him. And so I tend to think about people based on what they've done rather than who they really are. And I, I want you to think about that for a moment because... What you do can never take the place of who you are. And if you don't work at it, you will actually, uh, your life will live a different testimony. You'll be trying to prove who you are by what you do. Amen? 
And you cannot do that. I want you to look at this passage of Scripture in Proverbs 22, 1. It says, a good name. Now, just substitute this for character, because that's basically what it means. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches and fame. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. Now, I want you to get a mental picture, and if you have to close your eyes, I want you to think about how people think about your name. If you were to share your name out loud, okay, on the count of three, everybody whisper your name, okay? One, two, three. Now, what do you think people think of your name when they hear it? Do they think of what you do, or do they think of who you are? Do they think of what you've accomplished, or do they think about your character? Which one? I want to I tell you, never allow what you've done to take the place of who you are. If you've done great things, understand this. While your accomplishments may be lauded at work and in this community and in your world, they don't mean the same to your kids. And, and what you do out there will never take the place of having character at home. Having character of being a great dad and a great uh, husband and a great mom and, and, and a great wife. It won't take the place of that. So always know that never allow what you've done to take the place of who you are. And I'd say that on the negative side as well. Those of you who've had a rough year, maybe several years in a row, have been very tough to you. Never allow what you've done to take the place of who you are. I want you to go back. We just listed some men, and we listed who they. Uh, we listed their name, but we thought about who they or what they did rather than who they were. I'm going to list some names out of the Bible, and I bet your mind will go more quickly to who they were than the what they did. For instance, Abraham. Abraham was what he was the father of many nations that's not what he did that's who he was God changed his name from Abram to Abraham you'll be the father of many nations but what did he do did you forget what he did he lied he's one of the biggest liars in the Bible in fact his lies transcended the generation of his children and down to his grandchildren so much so that that Isaac and Jacob were fighting in the womb because of the depth of deception that started with Abraham but we don't think about that do we that's what he did <laughs> We think about him being the father of many nations. Think about Moses. Moses is a great deliverer. This is who he was. He's the most humble man in the Bible. And at the same time, the greatest leader that ever lived is Moses, his friend of God. That's who he was, and that's how we remember him. We don't remember him for what he did. What did he do? He killed a man. And then he ran away and quit. He hung up the cleats for 40 years. He said, I'm done. I'm out. We don't remember that. When we hear his name, we remember who he was. Think about David, King David, the greatest king of all kings. David was a warrior poet who wrote the Psalms. He, he was the one who from his, his seed came the Messiah. That's who he was, and that's how we remember him. But do you not remember what he did? He killed a man after sleeping with his wife and getting her pregnant and committing adultery. My point is this. The legacy of who these men were outlived what they did. I'm not saying that what they did was okay. I'm just telling you that the legacy of who you are can outlive what you have done. Don't give up based on what you've done because God is not done with who you are. Amen? Don't give up based on what you've done because God is not done with making you who you are. I want you to hear that today. Here's the second thing. So focus on character over accomplishment, okay? And you can, God's grace can rectify any life. He can redeem anything. If he can't, he's not God. Here's the second thing I want you to know, though, is live for the eternal rather than the temporal. First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 15, look at what it says. We are here, where's here? In this earth. Only for a moment. They call 75 years, 7.5 a moment. Visitors, strangers in a land as our ancestors were before us. Guess what? There was people who lived before us that only lived 75 years or thereabouts, and they thought they were going to live forever too. Our days on this earth are like a passing shadow, gone soon without a trace. Now, one of the concepts in life that's the most difficult to understand is eternity. 
Because there's nothing that we see with our eyes that captures eternity. We have to think about eternity in concepts that confound us. And so it's a very difficult concept. And so I, I, I want to try and illustrate it. I don't know if it's going to help. I know it won't hurt, so I'm going to try it. Okay? Just imagine this is your life. A 12-inch sort of string of yarn. And it represents your 7.5 or 75 years on this earth. So this is your life. Now let me ask you, are we temporary creatures or eternal creatures? We're eternal creatures. We live in this temporary world for a season, but we were born in eternity, and we were born, born for eternity. But right now and here, as I'm talking to you, we're living somewhere within this span of 75 years. Now imagine this string was strung from one side of the state of Tennessee to the other side of the state, a very long state, which I traveled over during this holiday, seven and a half hours to get from one side to the other. Imagine a string strung out during that period of time. Wouldn't that make this little 12 inches seem insignificant in terms of its impact on that long string, right? Now imagine this little 12 inches, imagine that string actually going from the edge of Tennessee all the way to the sun. <laughs> you wouldn't even be able to find this. Imagine it going to the furthest galaxy that we can find with the Hubble telescope, which is about 12 billion light years away. I know this is an awful illustration because you can't see that. I just went into another concept that confounds us. But, but I want you to get the point here. Which string are you living for? Are you living for this 12 inches that's here and gone tomorrow, a shadow, a vapor, a mist? Or are you living for the long string, the one that is eternal? Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. He talks to us about the eternal versus the temporal. And he encourages us, do not lay up for yourself treasures in earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But instead... Store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot uh, destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. What he's saying here is don't give all your time and your energy and your effort and the gifts and the talents investing your life exclusively in a world that will not last at the expense of investing yourself into people and relationships that will never end. And that's exactly what treasures in heaven are, in case you didn't know. They are the eternal souls of other people. That's what he's talking about. Invest yourself in eternal things. The Bible says that the things that are eternal are things that you cannot see. But things that are temporary are the things that you see. But then it goes on to say, fix your eyes on things that are eternal. Well, how can you fix your eyes on things that are eternal when you can't see them? He's talking about living by faith. He's talking about living as a spiritual being. You see, long before you were born into this biological world or biological, you were a spiritual reality, and you continue to be so. So live your life while you're here in this 12-inch string of time for the long line for eternity by investing back into the kingdom of God and eternal souls, okay? And that's not money investment exclusive. I'm talking about investing your life, your time, your, your, your focus, your thoughts, Okay? So that's the second thing. These are the three big ideas. Again, they'll, they'll, they'll sort of be unpacked throughout the entire series, but, but I just want to give you these big ideas at first, okay? And then the third one is this, and this is really going to be helpful for some of you, okay? Change your priorities rather than your patterns. <laughs> Change your priorities rather than your patterns. Now, at the beginning of the year, you think about it, what do we often do? We realign our patterns. We maybe come up with new patterns, okay? But but we basically a focus on I gotta eat better, I gotta, I gotta change my reading habits, I gotta go to church more, I gotta drink less, I gotta do this, I gotta and you're thinking about what? Temporary patterns that you can maneuver and change rather than thinking about priorities. Now Jesus said again, going back to Matthew 6, he had just talked about clothes. Why do you worry about the clothes you wear? Why do you worry about the, 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 the house you live in? Why do you worry about the food you eat? Don't I take care of the birds of the field? Don't I take care of the flowers? Don't I take care of... Why do you worry about all those things? And then he said this. Here's what you need to do in chapter 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. 
So he says here, here's the priority I want you to focus on. I want you to focus on things that are eternal. I want you to focus on the kingdom of God and the righteousness of Christ. You see, here's the problem. When you focus on patterns rather than priorities as a Christ follower, there's two problems that come with that. These are in your handout. Here's the first one, okay? Patterns are founded on temporal changes. Priorities are rooted in eternal realities. Leave that up there. There's a difference. You see, while at the beginning of the year, you're changing patterns. I was doing CrossFit, now I'm doing Orange Theory. It's just a pattern. It doesn't matter what you do. Well, I was doing this thing, and they were delivering this food to my house. Now I'm doing this thing because it doesn't have any grass in it. Or I'm doing this. Yeah, what you do is you're trying to change and add patterns, and you, and you basically add a new, and you're bringing some in, you're rearranging them. But the bottom line, they're all founded on things that are temporary. It probably won't last very long because that's the nature of temporary things. So you're going to try, but you're, you're basing all of your hope on change on things that are temporary. Have you ever noticed that patterns never form priorities? But priorities always form patterns. So why are you trying to manipulate and change patterns when they can never become something that is a priority? Instead, you've got you to get your priorities right first. You got, you got to have your priorities rooted in the right thing. And Jesus says right there in 633, there's only one thing that will prioritize your life. If you will seek first the kingdom of God and Christ's righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. This is the foundation from which a spiritual person born in eternity and born for eternity understands that everything else comes from that. My, my health, my, my diet, my food, my relationships, my marriage, everything comes from that one priority. Amen? And that's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 verse, uh, verse 20 something he says after he gets done with the Sermon on the Mount he says anyone who hears these words and obeys them is like a wise man who builds his house upon a rock. What's the house? The house is his life. In other words he builds his life. Anyone who hears my words and roots himself in them so that they become a priority in his life. He builds his life on the rock. And so when the winds come and the rains come and the winds blow and, and everything is torment in your life, your patterns don't have a chance of standing strong because they're built on something temporary. But when you have the priority of Christ, he's the rock of your life. Guess what? Nothing will shake you. Amen? Here's the second problem with you focusing on patterns rather than priorities. Number two, patterns are tied to what you fear. Priorities are tied to what you value. <laughs> That's good. And it's so true. Patterns are tied to what you fear, not what you value. Priorities are tied to what you value. Let me give you an example, okay? Let's say you want to lose weight. Anybody want to lose weight? Don't raise your hand, but you want to lose weight. And you want to get healthy. And so what you do is you try and institute a new pattern, but that pattern is tied to this fear. I've got to eat better. If I don't stop eating sugars, I'm going to get diabetes. I've got to lose weight. I look terrible. I can't fit in my clothes. And what's everything? Your conversation to yourself or the mirror or your spouse is all fear-based. I've got to because there's a pattern, and the pattern is tied to fear. But when you have Christ as the center of your life, and from him and his truth, everything finds its proper place, then you approach it as a priority that is rooted in a value. So you say, you know what? I want my body to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. I want God's presence to dwell in me, and I want my body to display his glory. Therefore, everything I put into my body, I, I want to be prayerful about, and I want it to honor him. And what I do with my body, I want it to be something that can honor him, that can bless my family so I'll be around for a long time and can be a part of my future. I, I, I do this as an honor to God. I bring glory to God through this. Amen? Then think about it. Uh, some of you trying to, trying to raise more money this year, trying to, trying to uh, maybe get a new job. There's a number of different things that are tied to finances as it pertains to the beginning of the year and resolutions that we make. And, and if you do it based on patterns that are tied to fear, it'll be like, I've got to raise more money. I've got to Uber on the side. I got to do something because if not, you know what? I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to retire. My kids are not going to be able to go to college if I don't. 
And then that's your mindset. So you try and change and play with patterns, but those patterns are tied to fear. Whereas when you understand that Christ is a priority of your life, and there's nothing, and, and nothing, that, that, or everything rather, r- comes out of that priority, that rock. Then here's how you approach finances. God, everything belongs to you. Everything does. And so God, as it pertains to money, I want to honor you with this. This is just a tool. This is this little 12-inch, 75 years. is nothing to you. You own it all. This is just a tool within this little 12-inch strand of yarn that I can honor you, that I can put you first, that I can give glory to you by the way I use this tool that you've given me. And so here's what I'm going to do, God. I'm going I'm to honor you with the first and the best. And I'm going to save 10%. I'm going to tie 10%. I'm going to live off of 80. God, I'm going to trust you for the rest. God, I got the same problems anybody else has. I, the only difference is I'm going to put you in first place. That's the only difference. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to tell you, we're trying to build a legacy, not a mansion. We're trying to build a legacy, not, not somebody to, to, to say, say, man, what a great life you lived on this earth. We're trying to live a legacy. Amen? This is how we do it. We put him first. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to close with this. Oh, look at this line. This is so good. It's in your handout. When you value the right thing, then you fear no thing. Think about that for a moment. When you value the right thing, then you fear nothing. And that, that's the kind of life I want to live. That's the vein I want to live in. That's how I'm going to live a legacy. So let me share with you as we close real quickly uh, how you need to, uh, if you're going to change your priorities rather than your patterns, here's the priorities that you need to make important to you. Number one, this next year, to know God intimately. Now listen to me. Uh, I know that we live in a very Bible belt, saturated religious culture. I've lived in it all my life. And I just want to say to you, if you struggle with having a, a relationship with God where you laugh and you enjoy your life, and instead you are beaten down by rules and rituals and religious uh, protocol, and that's how you understand coming to God, you need to completely just get unsaved from that because that ain't real salvation. Okay, so I could say this and not be a heretic. Just dump that. You need to have a relationship with God. You need to love God. And you need to let God's love fill you with a joy and a peace and an openness. I'm going to tell you the only way to do that is stop making God a part of your life and make him the priority of your life. Because one of the reasons why it's so easy to fall into the trap of religious rituals is because he's only a part of your life. So he is that Sunday part that makes you go to church and do what you need to do and pay your tithe and do... That, that, ain't, that is not what God wants to be. And that's the reason why your religious life is so miserable. But instead, just love God. And when you love God, you can't help but obey his, his law. His law is not anything to be obeyed. It's a life to be lived and enjoyed. Amen? So the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 13, and 14, you will seek me and you will find me. When? When you seek me with all. Don't, don't let me be part of your life. Make me all of your life and with all of your heart. Now, I will be found by you, says the Lord. Now, one of the problems with you and I really having a relationship with God may be that sin is blocking the flow, the life-giving flow that you need. And maybe it's a roadblock in your life right now that is distancing you from God, and you need to deal with it. So maybe at the end of the service, you'll come down and you'll write down that sin that is keeping you from experiencing the fullness of Christ. You write down, you pin it on the cross. And you say, oh, Pastor, that's just silly. That's just writing something down and putting it. No, 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 it's not silly. That is you. You're submitting your flesh to do something by faith that your spirit man needs to do and obey. So by, by, in your physical nature, you're writing something down. You're coming down. You're pinning something on the cross. And you think that's not a big deal because you're doing it sort of in a physical activity. But as you're doing that, your faith for that is growing. Let me ask you, why is that sin still blocking Uh, your favor with God and the fullness of God in your life because you're not doing anything about it by faith. I challenge you this weekend to write down that sin. And and, and listen, you're still going to struggle with it. It's not going to go away. It's going to be diminished as its impact on your life until one day it may go away by the full grace of God. But understand, you're always going to be struggling with sin, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing because when you stop struggling with sin, you've just given in to it. Amen? This is good teaching. But that's a totally different rabbit trail. Let me finish up. Number two, 
Connect with others regularly. Ephesians 2.9 says it this way. You are a member of God's very own family. And you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Now let me just say something real quickly because we live in a different day and age uh, than when this was written. And I realize that many of you can watch this online. And that's a great benefit to those who cannot be here. But I want to say and I'm fearful that this has become something that it should not be. And I fear that the pursuit of convenience is eroding the pursuit of connection, which is the very heart of God. And so I encourage you to be a part of the family of God, to be in a service and to be here whenever you can. Online services and the, and the app is all for, for opportunities for people who can't be here. I'd encourage you to be here every time you can. I'm so glad that God didn't text us. He didn't DM us. I'm glad he didn't transmit the Great Commission through Facebook posts. But instead, God so loved the world that he came. And he became one of us. And he came to us. He connected with us. And I want to encourage you, get connected this year. Stop playing around coming once or every, whenever you feel like it. If you live by your feelings, guess where that's going to take you? Where it always has. Second best life third best life, whatever you call it. But if you live by a discipline and you live by a priority that is anchored in eternity, then you're going to see changes in your life that no amount of changing your patterns could have ever brought about. Yeah. So I encourage you, come be a part, connect with others regularly. And thirdly, we'll finish, serve people passionately. This is one of the things I'm really excited about personally in my life is I want to win people to Christ outside of this arena. I want to personally win. Uh, there's, a, there's a friend of mine down at the gas station. Bro, I'm coming after you this year. You are going to find Jesus, and I don't care if you come to church here or not. Uh, there are people that I want to win this year in a relationship with God. Amen? Yeah. Serve other people passionately. In fact, one of the reasons why you're still here on this earth is so that you can use the gift that God so graciously gave you to influence another person's life for the glory of God. And you participating with God and his plan for lost mankind is one of the greatest things you'll ever experience in this life because it connects you to that, that long string that we couldn't conceptualize called eternity. That's what it connects you to. It connects you to where you came from and where you're going to end up. And it's the greatest joy you'll ever experience. Amen? So let me close by asking you this question one more time. I want you to think about it. If you continue to live your life the way that you're living it right now, what kind of legacy will you leave? What kind of legacy will you leave? I want to tell you this series is not meant to help you achieve your, your, your New Year's goals or become the best you or the new me or whatever. It's not for that. What it's for is to help reshape your life so that it matches the potential and the purpose of God for your life. And so we're going to talk about a number of different things. We're going to talk about a plan next weekend. Don't miss next weekend. It's going to be extremely practical. We're going to talk about knowing your purpose. We're going to talk about making a difference. Amen? I want you right now, if you would, just bow your heads. Close your eyes. We're going to give an opportunity for you to really consider some of the things that maybe the Spirit of God is speaking to you. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, your campus pastor is going to come.